You're listening to the Leaders of Today podcast, hosted by MRL Consulting Group, a podcast dedicated to championing the leaders within the industries we love. Hello and welcome to the fifth Leaders of Today podcast with me, Billy Humphreys from MRL Consulting Group. Now, the Leaders of Today podcast is all about championing different leaders from the different markets that we serve. And today's guest we have is Rory Stern, Vice President of Northern Europe at Cyber Angel. Rory, welcome to today's podcast. Hi, Billy. Uh, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So before we start, we like all our guests to give themselves a very short introduction. So Rory, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, I'm originally from South Florida. I uh, went to Arizona State University for college, fell in love uh, studying abroad in Spain, uh, and upon graduation, uh, chased my partner back to New York City. Uh, that's where she's from. I took a job at Yex within three weeks of landing in the city. It was my first job out of college. Uh, the first time around at Yext, I was smiling and dialing small business owners, making 250 cold calls a day, six hours of talk time per day. Uh, it, was, it was a grueling job, uh, but a job that definitely uh, I'm grateful for and, and changed my life in many ways. Uh, from there, I, I did leave Yext. I went to two different companies, learned a bit about enterprise sales. And because of that experience, I did have the opportunity to return to Yext in April 2013, almost exactly two years to the day that I left in 2011. Uh, at Yext, the second time around, I quickly became one of our top enterprise salespeople, um, where we sold to the largest businesses in the country. Uh, and, and I got stuck into the culture and I was hooked. Uh, in 2016, they asked me to move to London to build out our, um, our business uh, across Europe. So Steph and I packed up and took the plunge. Uh, after a wild four and a half years of doing that, uh, it was time for my next challenge. I was fortunate enough to meet, meet Erwin Karaudi, uh, CEO of Cybel, uh, roughly one and a half years ago through a mutual connection, and, and the rest is history. Um, uh, so today we have an amazing, uh, amazing team, amazing product, uh, and, and that's that's how I got to Cybel Angel today, I guess. Great. So as we said at the beginning, so this podcast, Rory, is all about championing you. So we're going to talk about your career, find out how you tick, how you kind of operate, the highs, the lows. But first, I want to go back to the very, very beginning. So it's 2004. The Patriots won the Super Bowl. Friends aired their final episode on NBC. And the highest grossing film of that year, surprisingly, was Shrek 2. But Rory, you started your stint, as you've mentioned, at Arizona State University, where you studied journalism, communication and Spanish. So traditionally, obviously, I would say that people kind of fall into with journalism, kind of can go down that marketing route. What kind of led you into a complete different direction into sales? Yeah. Yeah. Fair question. Uh, and as you probably know, Billy, in the States, a lot of people actually don't end up doing what we studied. Um, so, you know, I got into broadcast journalism because as an American young sports fan, ESPN was life, right? And, and we all looked up to our, our specific uh, anchors or, or analysts and Stuart Scott was my guy. Um, so I, that's what I want to pursue. So I went to Arizona State. We have a great broadcast journalism program there, uh, but reality set in pretty quick. The reality is, is you're going to make 25K a year um, for probably the first 10 years of your life in a, in a small town in Texas or Oklahoma or Montana. Um, and, and this was before the real rise of the Internet reporter. Like you literally still had to actually be on television. Right. When yeah. we graduated on a set. Right. Uh, and, and then on top of that, as a, as a broadcast journalist, you still probably needed help from mom and dad for almost your first decade out of school. Uh, and that just was not in the cards for me personally. On the flip side, I also knew how lucrative sales can be and, and frankly is, right? I come from a family of salespeople. Uh, I mean, maybe you can even say a community of salespeople to an extent, right? Surrounded by people uh, that were successful in sales. And also back to that American mentality, you know, everybody's a salesperson. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a doctor or a lawyer in the States, you're a salesperson. So to me, it wasn't, it wasn't that hard of a struggle. Um, and then, um, you know, additionally, 
I was fortunate enough to have an incredible professor and associate dean there, a guy named Mark Lodato. Um, and, and he understood my circumstances. Um, he understood that broadcast journalism was not going to be my career. It wasn't my passion any longer. Uh, and he put his proverbial arm around me and, and we created a plan uh, to, to, to get me out of, of, of school without having to change majors um, and without having to take any reporting time away from the students that were actually legitimately dying to be on air. Nice. So what, so, um, but you take me as someone that could be on um, ESPN or as someone like hosting that or talking about NBA. I just think you have that demeanor. I mean, uh, like you could, that, that um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. You come across as someone that could easily talk. You're a salesman. That's what I'm basically saying. <laughs> like you can, <laughs> you can sell anything. So I guess has, has sports always been a huge passion of yours then? Like ever since you grew up? Yeah, absolutely. What was, I've, I've what, lost what was your sport lost growing up? Uh, for me, it was American football uh, and uh, a period of time of lacrosse. But I will yeah. say that American football was, uh, was, was took up the majority of my time as a uh, as uh, an athlete. And do you think you kind of have your sales head from being that kind of sport? Were you were you kind of the leader of the team? Um, I, um, I, I was always uh, a captain uh, in sports. Uh, always, uh, if I wasn't a named captain, I was at least a. Uh, uh, a leader in the locker room of, of sorts or a leader on the, on the sports field. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's really important. You have to understand how to lead people. You have to understand what makes people tick and all that stuff. But, but to some extent, um, I, you know, I guess I think that uh, I, I was raised around sales. Um, so I was able to see successes and all that stuff. So you said, so you landed in New York and you said within three weeks, you then landed a job at Yext where you were smiling and dialing. What's that like? Like if people are listening to this and they, they're not in sales, they're in engineering or mm-hmm. um, what's it like actually cutting your teeth back then? Cause obviously we now know sales is very different now to back yeah. to back then. So how would describe what's that? What is that like? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a great question, Billy. So uh, it is very different today than it, than it was um, when I started. You know, smiling and dialing SMBs was the only way I knew how to break into this world. The idea of a, of a BDR was just not a thing yet. And if it was, I didn't know about it. They weren't coming to Arizona State to recruit us. I'll tell you that. Right. Um, and I'm not saying a BDR is an easier job. It's just different. My in my world, I had to make 250 calls a day, roughly six hours of talk time, weekly quotas, uh, you know, uh, trying to get small business owners to buy your technology right then and there on the phone the very first time you spoke to them. And that was a very common way to start your career back when I got into, when I, when I landed in New York City. There's lots of companies that, that were recruiting for this type of salesperson. Um, and, and that was, it was very challenging. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, and at the end of the day, the job was, was terrible. Uh, <laughs> it was miserable, if I'm being honest. Uh, it, it is it is definitely something that you have to get used to getting kicked in your teeth regularly. But once you saw success, um, you know, it makes you uh, it makes you tougher. Right. It absolutely builds your foundation. You see um, you see the, the resiliency builds inside of you and there, you know, you, you get the fruits of your labor. So yes, it's terrible, but two great things happened to me while at Yext, right? So first, I made some of my best friends for life, right? People I still speak with today. Uh, actually, every day, uh, a group of us are on a, on a Slack channel, on our fantasy football Slack channel. Uh, we all start our careers together um, at Yext, right? In 2009. And to this day, we're still all in software sales um, in all different areas, right? Some are leaders, some are individual contributors, uh, some are an SMB, some handle mid market, some handle enterprise. So it's, it's really um, uh, kind of a wide array of people inside of this little group. And then the second thing that happened to me immediately out of college was I got to work for two of the best sales leaders literally once I graduated, right? So Brian Distelberger, co-founder and president of Yex, easily uh, has had the largest impact on my career growth um, uh, after college. Uh, And then Brian Rakowski, one of the most important people in Yex history, he has impacted countless sales careers uh, across the the U.S. and probably the world. So so all those things, although it was a tough gig to start um, and, and very grueling, 
it, it did leave me with, with lots to be thankful for. What were you like as a young sales rep? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, I wish you wish we were able to ask uh, one of the Brian's that question. Um, what was I like as a young sales rep? I was starving, uh, starving. I was motivated as hell. I had no money. Um, you know, whatever Brian, whatever the Brian's said, I just frankly did blindly. Uh, but I'm glad I did because that that's what I needed at that time. Um, I wasn't questioning anything at that time, frankly. Uh, and that was great. Um, but I was, I was energetic. I was passionate. Um, and I was just trying to learn and absorb, um, and be the best for those that hired me. So you've always been that hungry individual that really wants, even from being on the sports field to then being at university in Arizona to then that you've always had that hunger in you. Yeah, always. So how you, you mentioned briefly, you said about kind of, it's been, like the community you've been surrounded with, it's been ingrained in sales. Do you think you kind of, because you've been surrounded by it for such a long time, and you, you said it was your dad that who has been in sales, do you think that was always the route you were going to do because you kind of grew up in that environment? Uh, yeah. Um, again, I I, uh, I thought I was going to be Stuart Scott, um, uh, you know, a sports journalist. No, but you know, I think to, 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 you know, to answer the question here, um, my dad did have a bigger impact on my uh, career decision than I, than I probably thought uh, earlier on, right? Um, but I was very fortunate to be raised um, uh, with, with, you know, with my father waking up every day uh, until I was 14 years old, putting on a suit and tie and going to work, right? Built this amazing lifestyle. We had a great childhood. Um, you know, uh, he was, you know, frankly, the top salesperson, um, for New York life insurance company for the better part of a decade. And we wow. were really lucky to be brought along for the ride. Um, and, and it's funny cause like president's club is a, is a thing in tech, right. But it's been a thing yeah. in insurance for way longer than the tech industry probably ever existed. Right. Um, so, you know, we were going to president's club, um, trips for my father and they actually had several a year for regionals and, and, and global. And, and he would have to get up and stand and deliver a speech and a motivational speech and stuff. And people would want to meet him. And, and, you know, we got to, um, become friendly with the, the executives. Um, so you've and, grown up with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I was, I was raised with a proper silver spoon up until I was about 14, 15 years old, uh, where, where it did come crashing down, you know, fast, very fast. Um, and, and that also, I think, play, plays a massive part, maybe even a larger part in my, uh, my success than, than the, the first part of my life, you know, the first 14, 15 years where we were raised with a silver spoon and, and we were able to see the fruits of, of that labor um, that my father uh, was able to, to yield for us. Um, but that said, though, you know, all of those experiences that he, he did have did leave a very good impression on me. And, and I think that is um, something that I, I, I devalued for a long time. So you mentioned about it came like crashing down and stuff. Do you do you feel you that because obviously with sales resilience is a massive thing, and I think it's even just by saying that, and I think it's from you said you started at Yex, you then moved to New York. Do you think that's where your resilience has come from? Um, my resilience comes from a couple of different places, I would say. Okay. Um my resilience, one, um, comes from the fact that I, um, I have a chip on my shoulder. I've always, I've always kind of had a chip on my shoulder. And, and, and that starts with, I guess, the story I was just telling. When I was 15 years old, um, you know, I was on my way home from football practice. And, and I pull up. I believe my brother was driving me. And there was an eviction notice on our garage door. Right. Um, so literally I, I had an amazing life. We had a beautiful family. There's, I was the youngest of four kids. We're all very close. Uh, and then that, you know, my parents split up after that parents got divorced. Um, and, and frankly, my childhood was kind of over. Right. Um, I began working at restaurants almost immediately five to seven days a week. We always had jobs though. Even when we had, even when we had money, we always had jobs, but at this point they then had to have like almost a career. Right. Um, so I began working in restaurants. I worked at two different restaurants um, between five and seven days a week throughout the rest of high school. 
Um, and those are tough jobs. So, you know, it, it's hard to be doing those jobs and, and not to think about what you had and not to think about how do I get that back or how do I get some of that back? Or how do I get out of this, right? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? How do I get to that light? And, and those are tough conversations with yourself when you're, when you're you know, between the ages of 15 and 20 years old, right? So I think that is a, a part of my resiliency there is that I do carry that chip. And that's a, that is something that I never, ever um, forget, right? Um, and then from a, you know, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, you know, how do you manage like the, like the knockbacks when, you know, somebody tells you, you know, or to go F yourself or whatever it is. I, I think that's the job these days, right? That's, that's, that's what you signed up for. Um, and, and if you leave it all on the field, right, to use a sports uh, cliche, um, you really did leave it on the field. You gave every shot you had, um, then you have to move on. It's, it's a numbers game. And that's what we all signed up for. So at the end of the day, I think we all have resiliency in us. It's something that we build through practice and success. And once you start seeing morsels of success, you realize um, you can take um, a few people hanging up on you or kicking you in the teeth to get to that reward. Listen, no one has ever been honest like that and open up. And I think it's, it's humbling how honest you've, you've been to say and to quote you there saying you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth to then literally say it came crashing down. I think it's. Yeah, it absolutely shows resilience in how you've, especially like, like, like now that your whole career and how um, you grew at Yext and how, yeah, just just as you are as a person, that's that's incredible, Rory. Um, so when we look at sales, then Rory, what? How do you truly be successful in sales? Is there obviously there are clear attributes that you need to have to be a salesperson, but. Is it ingrained in you as a kid or can you be a salesman later on in life? I think you can be a salesman later on in life, but I do think there are some um, key attributes that are, that are very important. And it doesn't mean that you have to have all of them, but I think there are some that, are, that, that make it a little easier, right? So genuine curiosity is a great thing right? Genuinely curiosity about business, about whatever is in front of you, asking why, wanting to know more is a great quality of a salesperson, right? Obviously, we talked about resilience. We probably don't need to add too much more on that. Um, I do genuinely believe you have to be calculated to an extent, right? Um, it is not, I don't look at calculation as a, as a negative. I look at it as intelligence, right? You don't want to keep your customers guessing. You don't want to leave your customers in the dark. You have to be intelligent enough in, in large enterprise software sales to be able to think a couple steps ahead of the current situation, okay? So uh, at the end of the day, curiosity, resilience, uh, intelligence, calculation, um, and the desire to win, I think are great qualities um, uh, that, that, that you'd look for in any salesperson. So you obviously climbed the ladder very quickly at your previous company, Yext. Mm -hmm. Did you always want to be a manager? Did you kind of want to do that and manage teams or did you always, or was that not kind of in your roadmap? So no, it, it's, it's not something that I really put a lot of thought into while I was an IC. I thought about it once in a while. I would have these conversations with my mentors about it. But at the end of the day, when I was an IC, I was just wanted to be an IC for as long as possible. Um, be the best, work with the largest customer, make money, close deals. I was not looking for that leadership position. But then I hit many of the goals for that specific role. And then moving to Europe with a leadership position was actually appealing to me. I didn't rush into it. I didn't go looking for it but I am happy that I did it this way. Um, and, and, you know, I see what I see a lot of it is I see people rushing into it, which, which drives me crazy, right? You take your at-bats, you know, one, two years of at-bats, and then you're rushing to get into management, right? But, you know, you need years of at-bats to legitimately be able to say you've done it before. Um, and uh, if you've only sold for one to two years, did you really hit quota for both years? 
I, I'm not sure. Um, were you there long enough to be able to hit quarter for two years, right? Um, so, so, so to me, you have to really separate the two. Uh, you have your IC career, you have your leadership career. I believe you will know when it's time to make that jump. I believe that it's important that you hopefully have saved some money before you've made that jump. I believe a manager that is financially stable is, can, can manage more effectively. Um, it's hard to stop the rain on your reps when, when you're commission check to commission check yourself. Um, and then I think you have to be over your individual successes and your individual wins and your individual accolades. Um, I love seeing the people that I've hired blossom. That is like a whole new world to me. Um, you know, not anymore, but it was when I, when I first started in leadership. Now I love that. I love seeing my reps grow. I love seeing them move on to other companies and take bigger jobs and move into leadership. Um, so it's just a different type of reward. And I think you really have to think long and hard about what's important to you um, before you take that plunge. Last thing I'll say on that is I think it is also incredibly important to take your first leadership role at the place where you sold. It will make you a better manager. And frankly, you have more leeway there at, at, at a place like that. It's interesting because I, some people would say the opposite in terms of going to a brand new company. No one knows who you are. You can kind of stamp your authority when at your previous place, they know who you are. You've got the promotion. So some people might not value your position there. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I can understand that side of the coin. I, I don't agree with it, but I can understand that side of the coin. Absolutely. So what's your philosophy then on, on coaching then? Cause obviously you went into it, not really wanting to be a manager. Have you taken kind of your on sales coaching from your, from your sporting background or. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and from the leaders that I've been surrounded by. Um, so my sales philosophy is throw people to the wolves. Um, I do believe this is the best way to train people. It all starts in the recruiting process, though. You have to legitimately hire people who want to be thrown to the wolves, that want to learn, that want feedback. And as I said just before, they want to win. Um, I also do like someone who has a chip on their shoulder, has something they want to prove or they have to prove. As I said, I've had one in it and it absolutely served me well. Um, so I believe that you know, it could be you just want to prove to somebody that you're then you're better than they perceive. Um, it could be, you know, proving to yourself that you can break out of a certain uh, lifestyle and into a new one, um, whatever that may be. I think those things are important to identify. OK, so, OK, good question. Good leeway into this. What's been your number one driver then over the years to kind of be successful? Um, I would have to say it's that chip that I talked about. Right. So for yeah. throughout my IC days, um, it was, you know, uh, desire to be the best. I wanted, uh, uh, to win at all costs, not really, but, you know, I wanted to win, um, uh, the competitive nature of myself really fueled that the, uh, desire to not make the same mistakes as my father, um, uh, did, uh, you know, no disrespect, uh, conversation I'd have with him. Um, but that, that definitely fueled me, um, and getting myself back, um, or getting to financial stability, uh, was, was, was maybe the biggest driver, uh, ensuring that I was setting myself and Steph up for a, a clear future, frankly. And I know it's, it's a terrible thing. Money, you know, to say money is so important, but let's just be honest. It is. Um, so, so I think that's what drove me through my IC days. And plus, you know, it was very important to me that if somebody was ever to say to Brian Distelberger to Howard Lerman, who is your best salesperson? I wanted them to, to confidently say Rory Stern. Right. So that was what yeah. drove me a lot through my IC days. Um, but then moving into leadership pieces is, is very different. Um, and, and like I just said before, it is blossoming people's careers. Um, and you know, I, I definitely started with a chip on my shoulder from IC days. I still have it, but that chip just looks different these days. Now I want to be the best uh, sales leader in the world, right? Um, I want to help other people change their lives like Yext uh, and this industry changed mine. You talk about opportunity and 
you were given an opportunity to from from a leadership side at EX to then go over across the pond over to Europe. That's a big gamble in in into you know your you're living, I guess you'll be, you're living in New York. What's that like in terms of someone's listening to this and they are similar situation to you were back then, they've been given an opportunity with their business to grow their EMEA team out. What, yeah. what was kind of running through your head with that? So for us moving to Europe was, was a massive decision, very big decision. I would say it was probably more exciting than nervous to be fair. Um, you know, it's, it was a decision that Steph and I took seriously and, and we're very happy that we did and we wouldn't change it for the world now. Um, professionally, it was, it was incredible, right? Um, Brian and I hit the ground running together, which was amazing. I got back to learning from Brian Distelberger again on a daily basis. You know, um, he was, he, again, my, my largest mentor uh, and coach uh, professionally for sure uh, and in life, but we, we kind of got separated a bit um, because we were both so damn busy. I mean, obviously he's the president and founder, so it's easy to say what he's doing, but you know, I'm also on the sale on the, on the road every day for three years, all of us were about five of us, six of us were on the road every single day as salespeople um, somewhere in the country trying to sell. So my distance to Brian um, uh, lengthened. Now coming back into Europe together, was amazing because now I got to learn again directly from him. And that was important to me. Um, so learning, so, so that was, was the exciting part and, and learning how to build a business from the ground up in Europe uh, was a whole new skill set to me because I, I, I did it in the States with them, uh, with Brian uh, in the U.S., but now doing it in Europe was, was awesome. You've mentioned Brian a couple of times, and I would probably say from the way you're speaking, he's probably been one of your biggest kind of mentors that stands out. Has yeah. the, Have you had many other um, inspirations over the years that have really stood out and kind of made you kind of how you are today? Oh, God, yeah. Um, yes, and Brian is definitely up there. Um, and, and, uh, you know, he's taught me a, a ton, both Brian's Rakowski and Distelberger. Uh, my dad is definitely there. Um, you know, but just being a part of his life and being a part of, uh, of his sales community, like I told you about, uh, earlier, the president's clubs trips and, and just being in the industry. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my, my grandfather and my uncle as well, not from a sales perspective, but just lifelong role models, um, then, you know, different phases of your life, you have different role models. So in different, different, um, uh, uh mentors. So when I was in college, uh, I'm a gentleman by the name of Robert Danoff, you know, he, he's a massive, um, influencer on my life. You know, he sat me down, uh, as I was graduating from school and said, Hey dude, like, calm down. You're going to be fine. I was going through a very tough time financially. Um, you know, debt, debt coming out of the wazoo when I was 19 years old, uh, didn't think I was ever going to get out of Scottsdale. Didn't think I was ever going to get out of the restaurant business. Um, I was coaching Scott, uh, pop corner football with my, my, my best friends. And, and he was one of the fathers of the kids. And he, he was a great guy, sat me down, took me to lunch and, and built this relationship with me and said, chill, man. We're going to create a plan. We're going to get you out of here, right? Uh, he's the guy. Um, Jason Sokolo was my manager at a restaurant in Scottsdale, uh, Arizona. Um, he is easily the most resilient person I know on the planet. Uh, and, and the attention to detail that he taught me uh, and the no excuses mentality, uh, incredible. Then you have the people at Yext, obviously, Howard, Brian, and Brian. They were my first leaders. Uh, Wendy Sturgis. Uh, spent obviously, you know, working for her for seven plus years. Then we brought in all these Salesforce guys that were awesome. Uh, obviously scary at first for us, but they, they were great. They are great. Lindsay Johnston. Um, he was my first, uh, manager who was not named Brian. Um, <laughs> then, uh, Dave Runitsky, uh, came in Patrick Blair, Steve Goldberg, Jim Steele. These guys brought a whole different, um, uh, uh, point of view to our business. Um, the ability, you know, I'm very fortunate that I, that I have the, the ability to, to call these guys and ask them questions. Uh, we had John Charens, Todd Albright, Luis Baptiste Coelho, um, and also Yex guys. Um, and then non salespeople at Yex, uh, Alok Bouchon, um, and, and obviously Steve Cakebread. 
Um, you know, he, these are people that had massive impacts on me that let me just go in and ask them questions on, on, on anything related to the business. Um, and then I guess, uh, outside of the ex, um, Mitch Spolin, my cousin, um, I was very fortunate to, to be able to, in my earlier days, and even today call him for advice. Um, he ran North America field sales for Yahoo, then went on to run living social North America. Uh, and now he runs Chegg. So very fortunate there. Um, so I, yes, and I, I believe in mentorship um, and I believe in, in learning from those um, before you. Have you had the opportunity to, like you were saying when you were 19, when you were kind of at university, have you had the opportunity to kind of grab people by the shoulder at that age and kind of go, there's, there's a way out? Yeah, at 19, frankly, no, I I, I, um, I, I don't uh, have much. I don't have, I don't have any mentor uh, mentees uh, that are that are under uh, 22 years old, I guess. But I definitely, um, I definitely work with lots of people um, on helping them find their career path and helping them find what's next. Um, so you know, is it, be it somebody that I've hired, I've hired countless numbers of people uh, across Europe and the States. So uh, be it people I've hired, uh, be it the siblings of those people I've hired, be it people uh, at Yex um, over my 10 years that just, you know, wanted to ask me questions and, you know, saw me in between my business trips in the hallway and, and wanted 15, 20 minutes for a cup of coffee just to talk. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I really enjoy it. So I think there probably isn't uh, a day that goes by that I'm not talking to a, a young person, um, you know, looking for advice. And I think you are a perfect person. Like you've just from talking today in terms of the ups and downs or the roller coaster that you've had, you are, I can't think of a best, better person from a sales side to do that. Um Okay, so obviously let's talk about Cyber Angel. You're obviously there to head up kind of the nor Northern Europe. What's your what's the plan? Is it to really to dominate and to grow that the sales function? Kind of what what's your what's your big plan there? Yeah, the big plan is to do just that, Billy. Um, we are we're we're building. Um, so, you know, we have boots on the ground uh, now, as of now, here in London. Um, I am building out the sales team as we see fit. We need account executives. We need BDRs. Um, and, and we're going to, we're going to hit the ground running. Uh, we have a fantastic product. Um, it is, it is something that we're proud of. We are the technological leader in third-party data leak protection uh, on places like connected storage, open databases, uh, and obviously in the cloud, uh, we can do things like domain threat protection and cyber due diligence, um, and even help with remediations and takedowns. Um, and, and the best part is I've been here for five weeks now, had many customer and prospect conversations and the technology works. Um, so that always helps. Me, exactly right, Billy. Uh, so that's exciting to me. I'm real fired up. Um, we're hiring great people right now um, to, to spread the gospel. And is that kind of, what's your, what does your ideal team look like? Yeah, that is, um, that's a, that's a fair question. I think that is like the, the most exciting part of being a series B company um, or, you know, yeah, series B company versus anything later stage versus uh, a publicly traded company is you do really get to look at your, at your roster, like a general manager. So if I'm being, um, you know, prescriptive, there's two roles that I'm really looking for, a BDR role and the account executive role. And they are obviously very different profiles. So um, from a, uh, a BDR perspective, I'm looking for recent college graduates um, in the UK who are smart, energetic, full of positivity, like to smile, can tell a good story, and most importantly, want to win. I fully believe in, in smiling, okay? One of the rules that uh, we had at, at, uh, at Houston's in, in, in college when I waited tables was if you were to answer the phone, part of your uniform when you answer the phone is to smile, okay? So I, I take that with me and I, I fully believe in that. 
Um, it's, it's about energy. You're selling energy as a BDR. Okay. Then from an AE, this is where it really gets to be interesting and fun. Okay. You know, money is not infinite in my world. Building your roster is so much more interesting at this level. I know my budget. I know what I can afford. I know who I'm selling to. We sell to the largest enterprise businesses in the world. Well, I cannot afford a whole team of reps who have sold to the largest businesses in the world, um, period. I can't do that. So I need to, to take the budget that I have and maybe get a little creative. Of course, I want one of those guys, at least, that has experience selling to large enterprise. But at the same time, I also am very interested in speaking to people that have had a great track record in mid-market at a established software company that had a great training program, perhaps, um, that has a that is ready to learn further, and now I can help them advance their career and change their lives. Okay, so it's just, you know, there's a few different ways to think about it, or I can go out and find a large enterprise rep from a different industry that also wants to change their life because they want to get into software uh, as well, maybe away from media or, or what have you. Um, so those are things that I look for as well. Nice. It sounds great, Rory. The kind of the whole data protection, cyber's massive. I think over the last five to eight years, it's just taken over the planet in terms of people's data their privacy and i think it's it sounds so exciting kind of what you're doing there um okay final question we like to end this and it's the same question we ask what advice and this is always the main thing about advice and i think this is a big part of of the podcast what is the main advice you'd give to anyone that is really looking to leap into that senior management role so take it from a sales perspective they they already could be a sales manager, but they actually want to go. They want to go above that. What what do they need to do? What's the one real bit of advice that you'd give to people? Make sure you're ready for it. Um, I would say the, some of the. I mean, there's not just one piece of advice. I mean, I think I think if I have to give one piece of advice, is it's truly take a look at everything around you. It's going to change, right? Um, your compensation changes. How you get compensated changes. Um, what success looks like changes. The personal accolades go away. The personal attention goes away to an extent. Um, so, you, so the first piece of advice is take a look at your world and are you ready for those things to change? Okay. Um, then from, you know, another piece of advice I think is, is important, but not talked about, not spoken about is have some financial stability. I've said this several times now, but I think most salespeople have experience what it's like to work for a manager that does not know how to control or manage up. It doesn't know how to control the rain on their reps, right? They don't know how to protect their reps. Um, and that's a lot of times because they are getting beaten from above, right? For lack of a better term to perform numbers, to drive deals. And frankly, they don't know where their rent check is coming uh, either. Right. That, that, that can be uncomfortable. That can be dangerous. And I think being able to sleep at night, having some sort of financial stability really, really uh, is, is, is underrated. Um, that is something that I think about. Um, and then I also do believe you need to think about a, a sales methodology or philosophy that you want to install. Um, I do believe that is something that people didn't necessarily think about in the earlier days, um, but now you, there are some clear methodologies that are coming out that are um, strong and help and help you push deals forward and help you forecast better um, and help you be more more calculated. Like you said, there's definitely multiple bits of advice, but I think you've given more than enough throughout this podcast, Rory. Um, that's it. You know, first of all, I want to say thank you. You know, you've been so open and honest on this podcast. I didn't expect anything of the sort to be to have you kind of laid everything open um, and you've kind of been very honest. And I think a lot of people listening will really respect that. And maybe people have had similar similar kind of situations to them. But I think it's your you've just shown that how you can go through not such a great time as a teenager to then going through that and powering through. And 
landing at Yex and now being where you are um, in the UK, it's 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 phenomenal to um, to hear your story. So thank you so much. Have you enjoyed being on today? No, it was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you said this was the first podcast you've ever done. First podcast. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think you'll be on many, many more to come. So, Rory, thank you very much for being on today. To everyone listening, thank you so much. And um, please keep your ears peeled for next month's podcast with our next guest. And Rory, once again, thank you very, very much. You're listening to the Leaders of Today podcast, hosted by MRL Consulting Group a podcast dedicated to championing the leaders within the industries we love.